You've had five bosses in your career, is that right? Peter Thiel, Reed Hoffman, Max Lev, Chin, Jack Dorsey, arguably Vinod. My job is not to let the person I report to make a mistake, whatever I have to do. The mistake by the leader is potentially catastrophic, certainly as asymmetric downside. So I always blame myself when the decision, the outcome isn't what I wanted. It's not Peter's fault or it's not Reed's fault or it's not Max's fault, it's mine. Because I didn't persuade them correctly. And so I think taking that with me allows you to pair very well with visionary, ambitious founders. I think the most important step early in my career was to implement their ambition and their vision. I didn't have an alternative ambition and vision. It was like, make them successful by using the skills, traits, characteristics, levers I knew how to deploy. Keith, thanks for doing this. Pleasure to be back. And I want to do stuff different than what you normally, I feel like in listening to some of your other uh, podcasts, you get a lot of like, uh, politics questions these days, like wokeism and all that. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole too much. What, what I want to know is, so you created a bunch of different, interesting, concise, thoughtful frameworks. I went back and listened to your YC, which everyone should listen to. We How to operate. How to operate. 2013. 2013. Three of them that sort of stood out to me, ammunitions and barrels, uh, two by two matrix of, of delegating versus consequences, uh, and then growth rate of an employee versus growth rate of a business. I thought those were, you've been in the CEO seat now at Open Store for how long? Two years. Have you changed any of those or any other frameworks uh, that you've had in the past as you've been back in the operating seat? Not yet. Those three frameworks were designed to answer like three very common problems, very common questions I received from founders. So I'm adding headcount, why are things not accelerating? Why is our product velocity slowing down in fact? First framework. Second framework, how do I know when to make a decision, when to delegate it? Classic question from a CEO to a board member, to advisor, mentor, conciliar. Third question around how do you know when to replace someone, how do you upgrade So when you know when to upgrade, when you hire externally versus internally promote. So I basically try to address all of the three common questions I get from founders and CEOs. So I don't really have a third or fourth. The fourth question, I don't know what the current fourth question is, but when I get a common question, I try to find something I can write as a baseline and then use that with CEOs so they can do a lot of pre-digesting versus custom advice every single time. Yeah, Delian also did a really uh, uh, concise post on his blog about a bunch of things related to this, updated with graphics that I would recommend everyone go look. Lessons from Keith, I think it's version three. Yeah, did you, uh, have there been any new, if you haven't cultured any of those, any new or different things uh, that you've sort of found in stepping back in after what? Eight years, not yeah, like yeah, like almost ten. Um, it's a little bit like I feel like Michael Jordan is going to minor leagues, playing baseball, yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying to come back to the company. Um, so yeah, your muscles atrophy. Definitely being a venture capitalist, you develop a lot of bad habits. You may get, you may learn some new things, but you also sacrifice a lot of insights, a lot of memories, um, and a lot of skills. And it's taken about a year or two for those muscles to redevelop. Uh, I. For example, I grade myself for a quarter, and the first year, best case, I got a B plus in a quarter. Usually, it's below that in my self grading. Last Q4, maybe I was a B plus. Q1 this year, definitely A minus. And maybe this quarter, I'll finally get an A. But that's a, a decade of atrophy. What was like writing a YP? You sort of stepped right back into it, and what what sort of required redeveloping those muscles? The easiest things to retain are hiring, assessing people, closing candidates. So you're essentially doing that as a piece. Make sure it's very similar. You're assessing entrepreneurs. You're helping them assess executive candidates. Like I interview a lot. 10, 15% of my time calendar is interviewing candidates for portfolio companies, providing feedback to the founder, sometimes helping close. So that skill really has an actually might even maybe even improved. The performance management of getting people to do things at a faster tempo, increasing the quality, uh, working together, even though they have different views, that those kind of skills really become um, difficult when you take your sort of foot off the gas, the tempo setting, the tempo setting, the pace, creative problem solving took me the first year to recreate that ability. I think in the last year, I've been pretty good at the creative problem solving, but that, that, that also the venture capitalist might use that skill once in a while, but really leading by example, Sapphire is completely gone. Like the adventure, you're not leading by example. You're not outworking any founder. You're probably underworking every founder. Yeah. Secondly, you don't have a large team here that you're leading by example. So there's just a lot of differences. Um, actually watching some of my best founders has reminded me more than actually, uh, it's probably the best way 
to rebuild these skills of watching the best 1% of founders of different traits and trying to imagine putting myself back in their shoes rather than trying to recreate myself, you know, back when I was in my prime. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Now, a few of the other like uh, operating things that I've heard you talk about, I sort of want to go through some of these points to get you to elaborate on them. One of, one, one of which is you hate OKRs. I do hate OKRs. Um, the biggest reason, this is a lesson, and there are one or two views I've changed since 2013. One is about outputs versus inputs. I used to be more on the side of measuring outputs. Think high output management by Andy Grove. If you watch my wife's I'm not sure it's mostly focused on outputs. I've shifted to mostly valuing inputs and, and looking at the outputs as a byproduct. Um, that's been a 10 year journey. Do you think venture, I mean, because in our job, in a lot of ways, it's hard to actually impact the outputs once you decide on the inputs. Do you think venture sort of drove? It, may, it didn't drive, but it may have reinforced it subtly and subconsciously. The biggest drive was um, A square was more input than output driven. Secondarily, um, a presentation I watched by Jeff Bezos, where he was explicit on all these events of why you need to drive by inputs, why you need to gauge people by inputs, not outputs. And it really locked in my brain that he was basically right. So I had to recreate all my views and then try to harmonize my 13 years of running stuff with Bezos' views and a little bit of square and a little bit of venture. And so what, what was Bezos' point or what's the reason why inputs should be a focus more than outputs? The biggest reason is that you want people to create fundamental breakthroughs. Value creation in startups is, is the goal. And that's usually a proverbial 10x breakthrough. If you ask people to drive their roadmap through OKRs, they will only give you and sign up for things that they know how to do. Breakthroughs, by definition, when you start, you don't know the answer. And so your best people, if they think they're being measured by outputs, will never raise their hand and say, I'm going to take on this heroic initiative where I don't know the answer. I don't know how much time it's going to take. I don't have line of sight to the solution. But that's how you create iconic companies is by the best people, not the worst people, signing up and saying, I'm going to solve this problem, whatever it takes. So that was the most insightful comment because it resonated with me instantly. So why we use this at PayPal, Peter had a different way of framing this. At PayPal, he had a focus point where everybody was assigned one thing, one thing only, he wouldn't talk to you about anything else you're working on. His way of communicating the inputs and the breakthrough import was, I'm only gonna allow you to look at one challenge and don't talk to me to solve that challenge. So you would bang your head against the wall for days, weeks, months, sometimes longer, and to solve that problem. So even if you used OKRs at the end or outputs at the end to measure the success of the initiative, you weren't allowed to get distracted and you didn't have a choice for what you raised your hands for because Peter would basically assign you what he thought the most important problems in the company were. So it kind of works through a different mentality. So I was really combining a little bit of Peter's focus theory with Bezos' theory and then the venture world where you have to drive by inputs, you don't have a choice. Oh, on, on the goals point and the focus, did, did, did you all push back on like only one thing within a company? Every, every single executive pushed back <laughs> Peter. Uh, mostly because Peter was hypocritical because he, of course, did more than one thing. Yes. But uh, no, we all tried to push back and, you know, it didn't work. Peter, once he makes a decision, it's very difficult to press his reset button. It probably, probably been successful on it three times in 30 years. Um, so we all adopted it. And then actually, over time, I developed a theory of why I believe it's actually a superior way to drive a company, which is, this wasn't part of his logic when I ran it by him two years later and he kind of agreed. So everybody has this uh, kind of list they use when you wake up in the morning, you write down a list of things to do. And there's a psychological satisfaction of crossing things off. So you usually put the list in order of importance, but then you cross things off that are the least important problems. Company building about is about solving the most important problems. And so you want to take away the other things on that list. So you don't have the psychological satisfaction of solving the other challenges. And you only solve the A well problem, and that's all you do. And once in a while, someone comes through and derives a solution to that A level problem, and then your company's going to work. I call it the, the for, for me, I've internalized that as the Kanban board problem, which is on a Kanban board, each item shows up the same size, but not each one is proportional in their impact at all. And so it feels equally satisfying pressing the checkbox, but it doesn't mean that that's equally impactful to the actual business. So I'll give you another way of making decisions that Reed Hoffman taught me in 2002 and three that I think most people totally misunderstand, including maybe people close to me where I spent years trying to communicate this. So, a lot of people make decisions by creating uh, lists, pros and cons. 
So Reed convinced me uh, in 2002 that that's a horrible way to make decisions because when you make a list, you're assigning implicitly equivalent weight to each of the factors. So I never make a pros and cons list on any decision, and I hate when people do that. And you have to decide different. You have to, of course, go on with a different methodology, but it's the equal weighting, artificial equal weighting, that these typical and common techniques lead to very mediocre results. It's interesting. One of the things um, I, I heard you say, I think it was in the YC talk, was actually the quality of office space and food can be a, uh, a good thing to just get out of the way and focus on like the quality that you want it to be. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I think basically you're creating a cult. So it's another Peterism, but basically any good startup is a cult. And a cult has unique ways of doing things versus the external world, unique belief structures. This is like, what do we believe that nobody else believes? A secret in some zero to one vocabulary. And to reinforce that, you want people to enjoy and choose at the margin to spend time in the office. So by making the office better, by making the manifestations reflect the cult. So if you're a design-driven company like Square, you want everything, every detail in the office to be perfect. If you want reflective behavior, for example, let's say a venture capitalist, you might want you know parks and like you know landscaping out the windows because there's actually research that that fosters creativity. So depending on what you want, you want a different layout. If you want collaboration, then you want an open office. If you want concentrated work because like what you need to do requires concentrated study. You don't want an open office. So this is all very top down. Like what kind of company am I trying to build? Why? And then make the physical plant reinforce those behaviors and traits. And the food side of it isn't that uh, you you believe in all the perks associated with an office, but it can be distracting if you don't have what people want. I think there's two things. One, uh, really good engineers, really good designers are world class at what they do. They're sort of like athletes. And you want people who are athletes to consume the best possible nutritional content because it leads to peak performance. So by improving the quality of food, you get better performance. Secondarily, there's distraction, just psychological cognitive load of like, what am I going to eat today? Where should I go to eat? Where should we meet? That causes distraction from shipping stuff. You want the velocity of shipping is the most important thing. Like you're an investor in RAMP. The most impressive thing about RAMP is the velocity of product. The product velocity is a function of people not getting distracted by artificial thing. By simplifying decisions so that people don't spend time going to get a sandwich, so people don't spend time figuring out what to order on DoorDash, but you're providing them food that they can consume quickly, easily, and health in a healthy, nutritious way, you're maximizing their performance and that cascades and compounds. How would you internalize that stuff for open source? Well, how is your office laid out? Where are some of these things? That well, you're we're actually moving finally in about a week to our ideal office. One large open floor plan all together, all functions. Um, it's, it's taken a while to get the right off, it, you, you know, building and doesn't always work at the same velocity and speed of a startup, but we're finally going to be in the proper office. So I'm super excited. I think it's going to reinforce a lot of behaviors. But we've always been moderately conscious within the choices. Uh, we work in person. We don't allow remote work. I don't allow resuming into meetings that I attend. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of reinforcement learning. Uh, you know, why do we have certain behaviors? I don't allow people to type the laptops in on a meeting because um, I want them focused, concentrating, debating, not like uh, typing. Uh, even the subtle noise from a keyboard is distracting to people's efforts in intellectually. So I think you have to decide all this stuff, you know, from a first principles perspective. What am I trying to create? What culture am I trying to create? What physical principles am I trying to read? What physical principles am I using to reinforce the behaviors I want? Do you not believe in remote work? I don't believe in remote work for our startups. I would not fund a company, founders fund, we're probably not fund a company collectively that's based on remote work. And why is that? Well, I think if you've ever built a company, I don't actually, I don't know anybody who's ever built a company successfully who believes in remote work, first of all. Um, the reason why is uh, another Peterism is you basically have to build a company on undiscovered talent. People early in their career that large companies, think Google, Facebook, whatever, they don't know how to process these people because you don't want to compete on the basis of cost. You need to find people that they're not going to want to attract and they need a little company. When people are early in their career or people are early in their craft in any career, they learn by osmosis. The way you learn by osmosis is you need to be shadowing people for unstructured learning. If you take away the unstructured learning, people cannot advance beyond the wisdom of their years. Secondly, you need to know who to promote. The way you figure out who to promote and give them opportunities by watching very soft, subtle cues that don't pop up on a Zoom call. So you need to have, you can't build a company with undiscovered talent and give people internal promotion opportunities if you're using any version of remote work. 
and the other thing is uh, there's this element of osmosis, right, that ultimately comes from being able to observe how people interact. And yes, so as a leader, I used to always try to try to have my desk, the proverbial desk, sit in the middle of the office so I could kind of look to the left and look to the right and pick up on these very subtle cues. And that would give me a um, pretty good signal. I could also signal on who to promote, who to challenge with more complex opportunities. Another reason why uh, the remote work kind of is destructive is there is collaboration that leads to sparks. So we launched an open store, a new product um, in February called Drive. We're actually, I devised the product on February 1st, we launched it in March, six weeks later. The three puzzle pieces that led to the product, one was a conversation at an offsite, sparked by my VP of engineering. Second was friction from my head of revenue who didn't like the first version of the idea and chewing on his negative feedback. Third was sparked, solution was sparked by two other things. A spontaneous lunch I had, or dinner actually I had with one data scientist at night where he asked me a question about were we taking enough asymmetric risk. And then last was an engineering review, deep dive that I did. The four things combined to be the insight that led to a brand new product that's been the focal point of the company for the last two months. Mm -hmm. That would never have happened. None of those four things probably would have happened on a Zoom call. What do you think about uh, moving individual contributors to, to managers? Do, do you take your best ICs either out of sales or engineering or whatever it is into manager? I'll hundred percent of the time. This is another thing I learned from Peter. Peter taught me the first week I was at PayPal, it's like I don't believe in general managers, which struck me as odd at the time, and this is 23 years ago. Um, he believed in promoting the single best person, designer, engineer, to run whatever the craft is. So that's my philosophy, that whoever's best at X is gonna be running X. That allows you to groom undiscovered talent because they know that the person who's leading the function is pretty damn good at what they do, and they can absorb substantive information. Also leads to better problem solving, because the person who's leading the function can solve the problem with very sharper hands if they need to. And then third is you avoid demoralization. People hate when they work for someone who doesn't know what the hell they're doing. What about, uh, so we talked about like things that can be distracting within the, the office uh, and one that has been on top of mind for a lot of the companies we work with is social issues, broadly yes. speaking, right? I think some people will characterize it as wokeism uh, and certain companies have sort of been further out of the curve on this versus not. Where, where do you think within open store or the companies you work with, like what is a social issue versus when does it start to seep over into a social issue that should stay external to the company versus something that's actually impactful to the business or the people? I think it's actually very easy to tell. If, the company, if there's some issue that's going to interfere with some business metric, then it's perfectly appropriate for the company to focus on. If it's not going to interfere with some KPI, then it's totally inappropriate. We, we like to say at Founders Fund, you bring your work self to work. And so, so if there was some discriminatory law in Florida, for example, right, on uh, transgender or gay rights or black or whatever it is, something, uh, would that become an open store issue? Or Definitely not. Yeah. And in fact, I would assume because Florida has a melting pot, people have a refreshing different perspectives, there'd be people on open store who have completely different views on all of those topics. Interesting. So, so it's just it, what, what's happening outside, even if it impacts you on the inside well, as a person, it's, yes, right, it's, it's not going to impact that, you on the that's inside. That's ridiculous. That's an absurd philosophy. Uh, we wouldn't fund the founders, fund companies and founders that have that philosophy. They can go take money from other people. Interesting. Um, switching gears to investing. Yes. What do you think of the role of a VC? Great question. Um, Sphere, I'm doing it for a decade now. Um, my personal version, of it, which is not for everybody, is I think my role is to fuel and propel a founder who has a credible potential to achieve his or her ambitions by giving them capital and serving as their consigliere. And, and so how does that manifest itself? Like, what do you actually do in that practice? Um, actually, usually it's responding to questions. So really good founders are, are driving decisions, executing constantly. But they have questions that they want um, either an intellectual framework on how to resolve, there's trade-offs, there's smart trade-offs, or sometimes there's experiences they haven't had yet in life, like they're hiring their first CFO. What should they be looking for? How do you assess a CFO? They may be an MIT grad who's a brilliant engineer who's never met a CFO before. So helping them triangulate to solve a new problem that's pretty important to the business's success. 
and or how to navigate complex trade-off decisions. The easy questions, they've already been resolved by definition. I always laugh every time I do a one-on-one with a founder because two or three questions in, it's all the hardest damn questions in the world. And I'm laughing because they're so damn hard because they wouldn't be asking me because they're so good. They would have decided everything that's easy. How was it hard for you to shift that two by two matrix of consequences versus uh, delegating decisioning that you talked about? One of the things I've seen when people come in after having success is they're very opinionated about, uh, well, here's how we did it and laying their exact framework or how past experience sits on top of the company itself. But ultimately you don't get to make the decision, right? You're sort of an advisor to that. Was that difficult with, for advising companies or was it kind of natural for you? I thought it was very natural. I think the benefit of being at a lot of different companies, you know, so helped build PayPal, LinkedIn, Square, all the different companies, had the vantage point of being on two or three other boards, like think Yelp and Zoom, for example, and just seeing how different each of those companies were with different challenges, different people, different cultures, led to me to believe that there's not a one size fits all answer ever. There are trade-offs that can be subtle. The grass isn't always greener. And my job is to communicate those trade-offs so the founder can make a wise decision based upon knowledge and, and the benefits of history. But I'm never, almost never, uh, I can think of one example that's really amusing. I don't think I've ever told a founder that you have to do X. I, I, I one time did, it's really amusing. It was on the most subtle mundane detail. I think he ever listens to this, he's gonna die laughing. But um, my conversation is always around, here's how I'm gonna think through that problem, or here's the subtle things to look for that might be going wrong. You know, if you go X, like here's the early warning signals that you might want to reverse course. Uh, but I'm very rarely prescriptive. I might be more prescriptive on judging a candidate. Like if they ask me to interview a candidate, I might have a strong allergy or strong enthusiasm and I'll communicate that. But on the business strategy, execution, the pacing and all of that, it's really, it's their company. It seems like you think about uh, what can go right. You're a people-centric investor that thinks about what can go right in certain situations. Have you, uh, it, one, is that fair? And two, have you ever been surprised by an outcome, like in your wildest dreams, it outkicked what you expected and your what can go right framework? So the what can go right framework was uh, insight I learned either directly or indirectly through my warrants of like always reminding yourself to ask that question. Because when you meet an early stage company, particularly I'm mostly focused on early stage investing, early, call it seed, series A, maybe series B, there's so many things that can go wrong. It's not very difficult intellectually to find things that can go wrong. That's like a trivial Being a cynic sounds smart. Yeah, right. yeah, well, it's very easy. There's lots of things that are unproven. There's lots of things that can backfire. So you have to imagine, you have to course correct yourself to retrain your brain to imagine, well, if this were to come together, is this going to be a company of consequence? Because not every company will be a company of consequence. It will not be iconic. It will not be worth $10 million plus. So you need to think about what's the upside potential against the risks that something go wrong. And then what is the strategy for minimizing or addressing the risk of the things that go wrong? Does the founder understand the potential problems and pitfalls? Do they have a probabilistic approach that's likely to work? But you want to start with what could this be when it grows up? What's the potential? It's like an athlete. You know, if you look at like an athlete in high school, you want to imagine not just like what are the limits of that athlete, but could they be the next, you know, Michael Jordan or so? And so on. It's a lot like that exercise. Also, being a lawyer is really bad training for this because the way you're graded in the law school is issue spotting. So when you take an exam, the canonical exam of law school is to identify all the things that can go wrong in the scenario and then you have to kind of resolve them and you get massively penalized for missing an issue. So you don't want to do that as a venture capitalist, as an early stage investor. So start with what could this be? Yes, once in a while, by backing iconic founders, but when you realize someone has ridiculous potential, sometimes they do surprise you on the upside. But that's when you're, you're making a conscious decision that the linear extrapolation of this business probably only looks like X. But this founder is clearly special. So even if most people would take it to a billion dollar outcome, there's a shot this could be five or 10, and that's worth me funding. So we actually did that relatively recently in Miami, last September, I invested in a friend of mine's company where the natural extrapolation of the business is a 500 million to billion dollar company, which typically would not excite founders fund, but he is exceptional. And there's a shot he can parlay that into an outsized success. How do, you, how do you pass that along? Because one of the things when people are early in their career, there's a, uh, a natural bias to not want to fuck up, right? Uh, like, hey, I don't want a big zero to go up on my scoreboard as my first deal. But it's a, it's a tension because that's ultimately the 
venture is a game of outlaw kind of or uh, power law distributions. How do you encourage that with people within Founders Fund to be able willing to take that level? Of risk? It's really complicated dynamic because I think to be an early stage investor, that's good. You have to be willing to lose money, and that's easy to say. The more success you've had, the easier it is to say. But unless you start with that dynamic, I think it's really hard to have success. And so it's like, which comes first? The confidence to be totally comfortable losing money. Actually, I actually didn't like for a while during the bubble era, let's call it 2019 to 2021, where not enough companies I was funding were failing. And I felt that that might be I wasn't taking enough risk. Now, I think it was partially propelled by people propping up companies with a lot of money and excess capital at inflated prices, and then that's changed. But I was nervous that I wasn't losing money. Um, I said, you know, Were you far enough on the risk curve? Yeah, they, well, I wasn't making enough risk where I was being too constrained and worried about what other people think derivatively, which is a bad idea. So one way I course correct, I mentioned this on a podcast before, is I like to fund things that I run through my algorithm of would half my friends who are VCs laugh at. The laugh test works pretty well because it's pretty intuitive. Like I imagine you laughing at a company when you read that I just let in the best. Yeah, yeah. And so if I think half of the smartest VCs I know will laugh, then I know I'm taking some risks. How does that actually play out within founders fund, like from a decisioning standpoint, right? You, you've been yeah. here a while and you're here, uh, have all the credibility in the world. So I assume not too many people laugh at you. They Pop still do. Them. I mean, I've been here four years. But I still occasionally filter myself and maybe too much. I did a KB. It was my fault, not my partner's fault. But there were times when feedback in a partner's meeting led me to either be less aggressive or more aggressive sometimes. And I still own the decision every time at KB, but it does affect you, even if you don't want it to, and even though you shouldn't. Um, stereo surround is useful, but you can also get caught in too much stereo surround. Like, so I, one of my heroes growing up was Margaret Thatcher. And she had this pithy quote that I always revive myself of. She's like, I don't read the papers. They might deter me. And you gotta be careful in venture. Talking to too many other people might deter you, but that's not what you wanna do. So for example, um, I was pretty, I had a very high conviction on DoorDash. It was very controversial at the time at KD globally. Um, lots of people were like, there's this company that does this, there's this company that does that, the economics are gonna wear it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, so many damn excuses. I would have not had enough conviction to pull the trigger and just shut everybody up other than Tony had worked for me. Like if I didn't have that little delta asymmetric information that I can just rely on, that early in my career, I would I would I, I would have listened to too many people. Um, there was another time when FAIR was started. Um, everybody was like, oh my God, you're you know, doing retail, blah, 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 real world, Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. And had Max not worked for me, I would not have been able to make that investment. There were so many critics at KD at the seed round that the Delta, Max, and Jeff, two of the four co-founders, uh, not only worked at Square, but worked for me, were directly hired for me, were you know, directly reported to me. I was like, no, these people are going to make this work. And you guys are all idiots. Like, and, you know, so you need to have that conviction um, sometimes. But there's times when actually I was a little too, let's say, nervous about investment bring into a partner meeting at, let's say, KB, and people will be more enthusiastic than I expected. So it cuts both ways, but you've got to be careful about like not listening to other people. Mm -hmm. Have you found it's harder or easier to take that level of risk now that you've seen all these successes along the way? Because I, I can imagine in one way, it's like, hey, well, I, my body of work will speak for itself regardless if this goes to zero. The other way is like, does this actually live up to those other companies? I don't know. I don't know if this is really going to be a fair or a DoorDash potentially. And so I could pass on you know, potentially great outcomes. I hope not. I think where the real lever meets the road is you get so consumed with board commitments and other commitments that you don't have time to take these fresh, provocative meetings. So like, you know, I, I gauge myself by did I make the right decision with the information that's available at the time, not with evidence on hindsight, because that, that, that doesn't really help. And I think my biggest weakness is in filtering which meetings to take, because you can't take every meeting that you get introduced to. And I've made some mistakes on which meetings to not take in my career, both as an angel and as a venture capitalist. But as you get more busy and more established in venture capital, it's harder to take incremental random meetings from some founder out of left field, but those are the ones that often pay the best dividends. Now, one of the things I think you're very conscious of, and this is something I think a lot, a lot about as well, is the why you in, in, in a potential investment. And, and uh, 
it's, it's something that I found people can delude themselves into thinking like, hey, I, well, of course me, right? But I think you're very conscious of, hey, there's, a, there's other investors out there. Why would I uniquely do that? Can you, can you talk through how you think about that and not delude yourself? Yeah. Let me, first thing is, let me say that the reason for the importance is most venture returns are mediocre at best. So you don't want to act like other venture capitalists because you're going to produce returns like other venture capitalists, either in your fund or collectively. It's a shitty asset class except, it's, right? It's, it's not very good. So like being the norm is not what you want to do. So one way is to create alpha is to say like, what is special about this or me that's going to lead to the probabilistic distribution being different than the normal distribution? And so I always want to answer that question. It can be, why me or why do I have an unfair advantage? So in the fair door dash cases, both of the founders, you know, have worked with me. I should be able to make that call better than anybody else in the planet. Like, if I can, I shouldn't be a VC. Now, when I meet a random founder, like for coffee, how do I have the competitive advantage versus you? That's not so easy to imagine. So I ask myself very seriously, why am I going to make a better call than Logan on this? Because if not, I'm going to produce the same returns as you know you or collectively, yeah. you, collectively the basket of VCs. So unless I have an answer, I know I'm going to rest in the middle of the bell curve, which is not my goal. So yes, it can be I have a personal relationship with this person, so I can make the call on the founder's qualities and traits better. That's a very good answer. It can be in some vertical, perhaps, where I have depth of knowledge, but that cuts both ways too. Sometimes you get burned by knowledge in, in some weird ways. But there should be a really damn good answer, or you're going to be in the middle of the bell curve, and that doesn't help. So I've heard you say you've never done a TAM analysis. Is that actually true? It's actually true. And why is that the case? I think markets are either intuitively large or intuitively small. They're intuitively large. Figuring out whether they're a trillion dollars or two trillion dollars is, is a useless exercise. Especially where you're investing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty early. I think as you get later, maybe there's some doubt and validity to this. But what I want to do is early stage investing 80% of the time. Secondly, I think you're fooling yourself because an extraordinary founder will create market opportunities you never imagined. And so the last thing you want to do is constrain yourself, you know, when you're talking to an end of one founder. And then third of all, the best investments are often in non-consumption markets where any TAM is like a silly construct. Like what's the TAM for Instagram? Like who, I mean, I don't even, I wouldn't even know how to do that even if I wanted to do it. But like, for example, when I had some TAM concerns, where the, uh, the team has outperformed any other you know, classic, let's say, TAM analysis. I was the first investor, first seed investor in um, Strava. Turned out to be a pretty damn good company. I don't think you could have talked your way into the TAM of Strava with any empirical analysis. Maybe you could have said, there's this many bikers, but actually there's the first market, it's actually pretty small. Runners, bigger market, definitely. Um, so maybe, but then nobody's paying for these things at the time. So what's your TAM? Like, you really do need to back founders, I think, in early stage, and they will take you to places that make sense. Um, also, it depends on the price you pay. You know, if you're going to invest in a billion dollars, you need to make sure there's 10 to 100 billion, a billion dollars there. Yeah. Um, oh, let's talk about Eventbrite, actually. People misunderstood the potential of Eventbrite pretty massively when Julian Kevin started the company. And basically, nobody externally really appreciated the company until they hit a $100 billion of gross ticket sales which isn't that large, but once they hit $100 million of gross ticket sales with about four or five employees, then VCs, at least some VCs, two particularly, appreciated that you get to, if there's $100 million of long tail ticket sales that four or five people could tap into, there must be billions somewhere, because otherwise four or five people would not have been able to get to that level of scale. So sometimes you are using like data points this, this time to market, like four months in market, four people get you to hear, well, there must be some afterwards. So it's not like I'm immune from that data. There, you can convince me with data that, oh, there's an error there when my interest dropped. So let's talk about there. People did expect that Amazon was crushing all these independent retailers. And Max had one slide that was incredibly developed to me, where he showed post-2008, actually independent bookstores were actually growing. So I was like, okay, well, bookstores are growing against Amazon, and anybody can grow against Amazon. Like, totally false narrative. So I needed one data point to unlock in my brain that the Amazon is killing everything is just false. So yeah, I do want those data points, but I'm not like doing a top-down TAM. In, in being a people-centric uh, investor, I've heard you talk about wanting people that spike in some regard, but they need to be the uh, the hero for the story or whatever it is. 
Are there questions that you actually are able to ask to assess this, or is it a total intuitive thing? How do you think about fitting the founder to the story then in that case? Like, so how, the, how do you know what, what, what they need? So there's two different comments. One is, I think, I'm looking for an extraordinary trait. The reason why is the chance, if you think about what's the likelihood that someone starts a company and reinvents the world or an industry in the proverbial garage with like their college roommate. Sure. Rounds to basically zero. So unless you're, you have a trait that is so extraordinary that the probability shift off rounding to zero, you should not invest. So that's why I need a top 1%, top 10 basis points, something spike, or I'm not going to invest. Then you want to ask a question. The second question is, does what the person spikes on relate to the skills that are required to build this particular company? Some of these traits are transferable, like if you can recruit better than anybody else on the planet, like if you can assess people, close people, that will apply to any company, whether you're building SpaceX or Facebook. Some skills don't translate. Like for example, if you're the, the savviest technologist in the history of the world, there are some companies where you could, like let's say we're doing a database company, a new novel architecture for database, sure, that's a perfect company to fund for that kind of founder. They wanna do a photo sharing app, I'm not sure they can really leverage that trait, so you do ask that, but that's usually the second question, not the first. And when is domain expertise a good thing versus a bad thing? So in my view, it's never a good thing. I don't fund people with domain expertise. I do like them to be able to a answer the Balaji and the Chris Dixon blog post that summarizes it, uh, intellectual maze question, which is Balaji, when he's teaching startup engineering at Stanford, had this great paragraph that explained how the, the most amazing founders can walk you through the roadmap from where they are to super success and know how to avoid the pitfalls, trap doors, and navigate. And when you hear the clarity of a roadmap, it's extremely rare, it happens once a year or so. That's a reason to invest, maybe independent of the traits, but the traits that are exceptional plus the intellectual roadmap is like a home run. It's like instant investment, here's your money, do not pass go, you don't have to meet my colleagues, here's your money, please, please, please do not take any more meetings. Um, that that rarely happens. That can be based upon some experience. So for example, um, one of the founders we work with in Miami, uh, before he left Uber to start his company, had been a warehouse supervisor uh, before he went to Uber, and he started a labor marketplace that connects workers to light industrial warehouses. So the fact that he'd started his career out of college yeah, as a warehouse supervisor was insightful, but it's the other traits about this founder that make him extraordinary and a top 1% founder in the planet. And, and do, is there, if, the, if not in the founders, at some, some of these companies you need domain expertise brought in so that yes. you don't fall in. So you can borrow it, this is the trick. You can always call up people with domain expertise and ask them questions. They're actually pretty happy to talk to you usually. And then you just say, why can't this work? So the question I always ask when I do diligence, like when, let's say I invest, occasionally invest in some pretty deeply technical things like autonomous driving or genomic sequencing. So when I call up experts, what I'll ask them is, tell me why this can't work. I don't wanna know whether it can work. I wanna know metaphysically, point to something that will make this impossible to solve. And if they can't articulate a specific blocker then I'm pretty comfortable backing a world-class founder to try to solve it. I've heard you say that the most successful founders are trending older than they were in the past. Do you, yeah, do you... we've observed at Founders Fund that there's about a five-year shift on average of the most successful founders in the, let's say, median age over the last five years. We have no agreement internally on what the root cause of that shift is. Do you have a theory? I actually don't have a great theory. I can walk you through some proposed hypotheses, but I think most of them are confounded by the actual data. So for example, some people think it's cultural, there's different influences, et cetera, et cetera. Some people think it's like this entitlement and wokeism and all this other stuff. I don't think that really drives. Some people think that the businesses are more enterprise, which requires more experience than let's say maybe a consumer. I don't think that's actually true. I think most of the logical hypotheses are defied by the actual data. So I'm not at all convinced of a theory that works. And so it's more descriptive than prescriptive for me right now. Now, you've stepped into more of a firm management, as we touched on earlier, and developing young investors, setting firm strategy, all of that. I, I think that was, uh, at least Delian said, with KB, you were more IC-oriented, sort of eat what you kill. And now it seems like you've taken on more of a firm initiative setting. Is that? No, I wouldn't say that. I don't, I, I don't I wouldn't agree with that. I think that one of the keys in venture is grooming more and more talent because it's a 10, 20 year journey and you need to replace yourself. I don't think venture capitalists age very well. Like there's a point at which you improve and there's a point at which you start decaying and we can talk about why and where. 
But so I think you always need to be consciously aware of how do you get more talent into your firm and how do, you, how do they learn by osmosis to be world-class investors. So at KV, I hired several people, Delian included. I recruited Evan, Evan Moore uh, to KV like three times uh, to try to add to the talent at KV. So I don't, I don't think that's accurate. Um, you know, maybe just because of my profile, I may get more inquiries from other up and coming investors that want to join us and they may route to me more frequently. So I may interview them or assess them more, but I don't think it's a conscious strategy. How do you think about setting a uh, founders fund strategy for the next whatever it is and influencing where you're headed uh, as a firm? Well, the way we generally do it is the GPs debate a fair amount. Um, you know, we meet, let's say every quarter, we do an offsite but like the GPs will debate, what do we want to do differently or better? Or what do we want to amplify or not? Um, so that's basically how we work. And decisioning, how do, you, how do you actually think through making an investment decision as a group? The historical way we've worked at Founders Fund, which is pretty different than most VCs, including at KV, we have voting thresholds. So for different size checks, you require a different level of support from different colleagues. So let's say you wanted $10 million there, I translate to our voting rules and know how many people need to approve that. And we'll introduce the founder to the requisite number of people or the people I think are differentially likely to approve. At the KV, we would do more like a traditional founder, uh, sorry, partner meeting on a Monday. Team would come in and present, and then we'd have a dialogue debate after and decide whether to approve an investment, you know, what terms. What characteristics have you found in the good young VCs that you've been around or you've, you've worked with? Well, there's not that many of them, yeah. by the way. I think one of the fictions of the 2019 to 21 era was venture's easy. And so people thought that entering venture early in your career was attractive, lucrative, and potentially easy from a lifestyle perspective. And it's none of those things. Venture is a really hard business. It's to, to be successful in terms of driving true returns and distributions to the LPs and to yourself and your colleagues is pretty rare. It's about the equivalent of being an NBA All-Star and to be a consistent NBA All-Star is pretty rare. And so I think now there's very few people that are young investors, qua investors, that are actually truly driving distributions for their LPs or for themselves. So I don't know what the formula is. I wish I did. It is something we actually discussed, like what's the formula for a future great VC? But it's a little bit like trying to predict who the next Steph Curry is. Steph Curry didn't look like the Patrick Ewings and Elijah Wands and Moses Malones, uh, nor did Charles Barkley, actually. And, you know, the, so you're trying to figure out where the sport's going and try to project what you want to hire, recruit, train for. And so when you bring in someone like Sam Blonde joined recently, yeah. uh, which he was a CRO of Brex and Zenefits before that, right? And, and so... When, when you're hiring in an operator that hasn't done investor before, like, are you doing the same assessment of where they spike? Is it more of a holistic liberal arts assessment? There was assessment? a couple, couple dimensions to hiring Sam. One was he had a pretty significant angel track record. So that is a good proxy. It's not a perfect proxy for venture, but it's relevant. B, as a byproduct of that, he also had referenceable CEOs who are in our portfolio that we respect deeply. Let's say Parker at Rippling, for example, that worked with him very closely. So that's a good proxy. Like, would you differentially take money from this person? That's the answer you want to hear from founders is, yes, I would prefer to work with this person versus the rest of the world. Mm. So like having a repertoire of people you've served very closely with that are very close to us that we deeply respect um, is a good proxy. So angel investing plus CEO respect are pretty important predictors. What do you think about the firm brand of Founders Fund specifically? How much of it is something that is set at a top-down versus the totality of the people that work there? Are there elements of both, or how, how do you sort of think about it? I think we'd like it to be maybe set a little bit more top-down, but what it's become is kind of a bottom-up evolution. So I think what the brand now stands for being courageous, having conviction, being direct. I, I think we can add some things on top that are conscious, intentional, but right now I think that's the manifestation is People want to work with Founders Fund because when we believe in something, we'll support it. We don't care what other people think. We will fund things that other people might not want to fund. And we will take you know, the proverbial contrarian stance that later becomes a consensus view. Think Anderil. So you know, my partner Trey co-founded the company Anderil to propel the United States forward in defense technology by using the classic tools of technologists and then allowing the United States to compete in the world. At the time, nobody else in Silicon Valley would have funded this company, period. 
Now, because of the, some of the changes in the world and the success of the company, there's lots of investors that chase after the company, but that's years later. So we're looking for areas where at the time, other investors have blind spots, intellectually, ideological, maybe by founder trait, like you can think about Parker that way. And then we'll, we'll, we'll take a, a conviction-based, courageous investment, and then later the company and the founders become successful in everybody else's view. Speaking of contrarian, you guys hired a crypto partner, we did. right? Which, I, it's been amazing to me how many people were so dogmatic about crypto investing and then pulled back versus actually leaning in. Like, if you believe this stuff, this should be the best time to invest, right? That was, that's the internal thesis. There yeah. you go. <laughs> so how did, how, did that, how did that actually come to be? And Because uh, crypto, you guys had held Bitcoin for a while. That was we public. And, yep. But you weren't as, as involved in other... We followed the, the historical view at Founders Fund going back to, I think, 2014 even, was most of the alpha in crypto could be obtained by buying Bitcoin directly, and it had the liquidity advantages, go in and out, you know, opportunistically versus obviously the company, we don't do that. Even if we wanted to, we probably couldn't. So fundamentally, crypto investing in Bitcoin was a very successful uh, set of investments and maneuvers by really Napoleon and Peter for the most part. Over time, we developed some views that there might be alpha in specific companies and that we weren't perfectly set up to capture that alpha. So we wanted someone who would help us if there is alpha in crypto-oriented companies, how could we make sure that we would capture a disproportionate share of that alpha? What do you think a lot of money has been raised over the last or, or 2019 to 2021, 2022, whatever you want to call it? A ton of venture firms popped up, a bunch of people raised a bunch of money. Uh, what do you think happens to all those new venture firms that were founded? Uh, I think they're in trouble. There will be some that break through. I mean, I've, I've looked at the list of like what I consider to be the top venture firms. You know, who do I compete with for real? Who produces returns that are real? About half are new over any decade, about half are the same. So there's always been a velocity of change, like half the funds right now that are pretty good, I suspect, were created post-2005, and the other half have been around for 50 years. Mm. And so I think there's always um, some refresh rate and variability in venture, but it's not, it's not going to be easy to break through, and raising too much money is definitely not the formula. As you know, we announced a year ago a $1.8 billion venture fund, and then we decided to cut it in half and make it an $800, $800 million venture fund. So we're voting with our feet that the opportunities are not going to be vast, that too much capital is not a good thing for either founders, companies, LPs, or GPs. And so we we literally slashed in half a fund that was already raised. And how did, I, I expect more people are going to follow suit with that. I think they, they have I, th to. I think LPs definitely, it definitely resonated with LPs. They were appreciative of it? Oh, of course. Like we're going to produce significantly better returns for them. And, uh, you know, because we don't rely upon management fees. At the end of the day, we are very light on the management fees and compensation, and we have significant potential and upside and value creation, just like a, a healthy startup should. And so LPs like the alignment, where we're only going to make real money if we produce real carry, which is a function of real returns to them. Uh, I want to I want to go through some quick hitters here. Uh, so I'm going to transition a little bit. But I, I think you've had five bosses in your career. Is that right? Uh, yeah, right, here's I the mean, list I had: Peter Thiel, Peter, Peter Thiel, Reed Hoffman, Max Levchin, Jack Dorsey, arguably Vinod. Uh, that's he the five I have. He wouldn't describe himself that way, but yes. What uh, can we go through each? And uh, well, I guess first, what do you think? I mean, those are all opinionated people, big personalities. Yes. What do you think, as a compliment to those people? What do you think you do particularly well that that's allowed you to sort of resonate with big personalities? And I think opinions? the most important step early in my career was to implement their ambition and their vision. I didn't have an alternative ambition and vision. It was like, make them successful by using the skills, traits, characteristics, levers I knew how to deploy. So I think that's being a compliment to a very strong-willed, visionary founder type, that's required. I think secondarily is to understand what, absorb the brain as much as possible. So I learned this actually as a law clerk of all things. My first job out of law school was to work as a law clerk for an appellate court judge in Texas on the Fifth Circuit. And the way she sort of explained the job to me on day one, my first professional job in life was, your job is never to let me make a mistake. And I took that very seriously and I've always taken it very seriously. My job is not to let the person I report to make a mistake, whatever I have to do. However, I have to persuade them. I have to go find new data points, marshal different arguments, 
figure out how to, because a mistake by the leader is ca potentially catastrophic, certainly has asymmetric downside. So I always blame myself when the decision, the outcome isn't what I wanted. It's not Peter's fault or it's not Reed's fault or it's not Max's fault, it's mine. Because I didn't persuade them correctly. And so I think taking that with me allows you to pair very well with visionary, ambitious founders. We've talked about lessons from Peter. I wanna go through quickly best lessons you learned from some of these folks. So Peter, I think we've hit on a few, but anything in particular that, that we didn't touch oh, on? Oh yeah, I mean, I basically quote Peter every day. Yeah. And they're often remixes to be, to be fair now, I've taken a lot of his views and slightly remixed them to make them my own. But then, like, in, just like in music, a remix can be arguably better. Yeah. Sometimes it's worse, sometimes it's better. So I'm hoping I'm getting the Glantis remix of Kygo, not the, not the worst version. But uh, so yeah, Peter taught me, you have to find undiscovered company, undiscovered talent, that's how you scale companies. Be the weakness of general managing. You want people who are excellent at their craft and you want to promote them. So a lot of philosophies that I apply all the time, the benefits of focus, allocating time, people systematically undervalue their time and happiness is another Peterism from 23 years ago. So I applied these literally daily. This, did, did he, are those derivatives from some other, I mean, everyone's sort of remixing some concept for standing on the shoulders of giants, but what, what has allowed him to come up with so many different frameworks and I ideologies? I and don't all? know. I actually think most of them are fairly original. Uh, maybe they're pithy, succinct distillations. Peter's really good at taking a lot of data points and describing it, describing a lot of data points in a really succinct, powerful, explanatory you know, equation. Simplifying uh, complex things is one, if someone can't explain it to me, it probably means they don't understand it yep, to the extent that, they should. That's true. Like uh, I also learned in law school, I had the benefit of taking constitutional law with uh, some really good professors, including Charles Fried, and he basically said, all complicated arguments are wrong. Right arguments are always simple. Hmm. Uh, Reed Hoffman. Uh, Reed, uh, Reed taught me the benefit of um, uh, two things. The decision-making framework that I mentioned of not falsely equivalenting using a, you know pros and cons. Don't weight everything yeah. equally. And then in negotiation, specifically the dimension of time. So when you're negotiating, most people focus on economic terms and other you know, pieces of the puzzle, but time can be your friend or foe. And how do you lever, how do you use time to affect other terms is something that's very subtle, but very, very powerful. What about Max? Max taught me a couple things. Um, the bottom up, uh, how to use metrics and KPIs to really drive outcomes. Secondly- By the uh, way, maybe talk about dashboards and how that relates to well, that. Well, <laughs> that's another whole topic. I gave a speech on, I was, the first time I was invited to present uh, to the Coastal Ventures CEO Summit before I joined as, as like an exact, was to talk about dashboards and how to do dashboards properly, which doesn't sound scintillating, but I turned it into a talk that hopefully kept most CEOs attention. But anyway, so I'm a big proponent of dashboards and that you want to orchestrate the dashboards as CEO or COO by yourself. Um, like literally go to the whiteboard and write out the business equation and then make the dashboards reflect that and use that to drive decision making across the organization down to every single person, including CSRs. And if you don't do that, you can't expect them to make wise decisions. You're just gonna get frustrated. Anyway, um, Max taught me the benefits of tenacity. Uh, Max is one of the most tenacious people on the planet. Also subtly taught me the benefits of fitness. Like um, when I was working at PayPal, we'd worked really hard, but Max would go for like a three mile run basically every day. And I remember looking up to the co-founder CTO and saying, if he has time to run, I'm gonna run. Mm -hmm. And I'd also try to shadow him. The problem was in shadowing Max on a run is he easily runs like a six minute mile, like very easily. He can run 430 probably. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, so <laughs> it wasn't the best, but it was, it was aspirational. Um, but yeah, um, Max Dobb, uh, also the benefits of certain technologies that I didn't have an appreciation for. Um, once in a while, I can spike on, there's a new technology which has certain characteristics that can lead to a breakthrough in business. And I didn't know how to do that kind of analysis in my brain. And he taught me with one specific illustration around Flash in 2003. And then I applied it later to other technologies. Which led to your investment in YouTube, right? It did, it specifically led to the investment in YouTube. Max told me to look for something based on Flash in 2003, in May 2005, I found uh, Kareem, uh, Javed Kareem, who uh, co-founded YouTube. And the first question I asked him was, is it coded in Flash? He said, yes. I was like, we're off to the races. Uh, Jack Dorsey. Jack, uh, so Jack taught me literally how to do design-driven thinking. So I've been an Apple fanboy you know, for all my life, literally since like eighth grade. Um, but there's a difference between like reading about Steve Jobs and Apple 
and actually understanding what design-driven thinking really means, that every deep, crafting every single detail, paying attention to every single detail, and how to scale an organization. So that's the most important thing. The thing that makes Jack so powerful is he actually is a first-rate designer, a damn good technologist, and a first-rate business person. And that, that combination of all three people maybe doesn't exist. Uh, Max is actually a first-rate business strategist and a first-rate technologist. Even that Venn diagram is extraordinarily powerful. Mm. By the way, this is the other founder answer. The third founder answer for me is combining two things you don't see together. So a first-rate salesperson and a first-rate technologist, I'd invest in that. Mm. Almost never happens. Like I remember this uh, first-rate technologist, first-rate business person description of Max. Reed Hoffman articulated this to me January of 2001. <laughs> that that's what was going to make Max special is like there's five, he's like there's five people in all of Silicon Valley who have that trait. Hmm. And what about Vinod? So Vinod is um, a technology visionary. He can immediately see a new technology and feel like almost intuitively all the ways it can be levered to change business equations, and it's extremely uh, powerful. But the most actionable piece for me, because I'm not a technology driven investor, was when he's on the board of Square he pointed out to me this adage, the team you build is the company you build. And you can get distracted in everything we do around products, technology, but it all comes down to the team. And that adage is the most important, succinct way to communicate it. It's always about the team you build. What, because we talked about the node and we talked about YouTube and you, you would have a unique opinion on this as a former lawyer and IP licensing rights. What do you, AI these days, uh, yeah. it's, it's, I guess, what is your perspective on AI these days? And also there's a fair use debate going on about all the training. Do you, do you have an opinion on that? Well, let, let's decompose this. Actually, so let's talk about the YouTube example. This is a really good illustration of the question you asked me about why me? So I was able to do the IP analysis in my brain for YouTube and then liter literally walked Sequoia's outside counsel through the analysis on behalf of the company. Which is what everyone was scared about. Everybody right. was scared of YouTube because of IP, and I had been partially an IP litigator. And so I knew how to do the analysis and was comfortable like taking risk. It was a probabilistic assessment, but I mostly got it right. Um, There's one little thing I screwed up, but there, fortunately, the statute- Background music. Yes, background music. Yes, yes. definitely. The, the separate licensing scheme that doesn't work like the rest of IP law, which is really annoying, but I sort of forgot about it, and that's why YouTube had exposure there. So this stuff's kind of recursive, but I had a very specific reason. I also had worked with all three of the co-founders at PayPal, so I had unique people and an intellectual IP background that allowed me to make a diligence assessment without having to call some external counsel that has the wrong you know, sort of risk appetite. So that's a good illustration. Um, on AI, my question on AI is not, is it transformative, not is it you know, revolutionary, blah, blah, blah. It's like, where's the value creation? Because that's what I do for a living, is try to find things that are gonna create going to capture the value. People use metaphors like mobile. Well, you know, most of the mobile value is cre uh, captured by Apple. So if OpenAI wants to ship a device or Microsoft that's powered by AI, I can see that capturing a lot of value. Uh, some people use AWS as a metaphor. Okay, well, all of the, the large institutions captured value in cloud computing. Well, that may mean that startup funding in AI might not be that great. But the way I approach AI as an investor is I'm looking at products. I'm always looking at products. What's the value proposition to a particular set of customers? AI is the magic wand that enables you to deliver a value proposition that would have been impossible before. And so I want to find founders who want to create unique products and they know how to use the tool of AI to deliver a unique product experience or an economically affordable one that would have been actually impossible. Think your proverbial why now slide. The why now slide is I can use AI to do X, Y, or Z, but the X, Y, and Z are completely independent of AI in the sense of the customer experience. Customer doesn't know this is AI X, Y, or Z. So that's what I'm looking for personally when I invest. Um, from an IP perspective, it depends on exactly what you're using for what. Like you'd have to give me a specific like, this company's going to do X. I guess an interesting one, I mean, certainly we're seeing it play out in real time with Grimes and yeah. Drake and all yep. that stuff, which I think is pretty clear. Like I feel like that's pretty, yep. now the, the training on top of Reddit data or Twitter data or whatever, a bunch of things that are controlled by a company in some way, but is being used to then train on top to answer questions that are abstracted away from the underlying data. I guess, is that a fair use thing? I think there's a strong argument for fair use there. The, the weakness in the argument, insofar as there is a piece that's the weakest, is if they're training on the entire corpus, typically fair use works better when you're taking a snippet of something and when you're using the entire collection, 
you can run afoul of some of the ingredients in the analysis, but I think more people would get on the, it would be comfortable on the fair use side uh, because you're abstracted it away so much. That said, there is a concept of a derivative work and you gotta be very careful that depending upon how it's used, it could be closer to a derivative work versus a, a new work. So anyway, it's it's more complicated. I think you're right. The music stuff is actually pretty easy. Do, uh, do you think there's an existential risk that we face as a country with artificial intelligence yes. in China? Okay. Yes. So um, I knew China would get you. The, the biggest the biggest competitive threat from a existential threat to the United States in my lifetime is with the CCP. The biggest arc of that competition is going to be through AI, both for economic leverage and for military application. It has actually a combination of both. And we are behind in several dimensions. Um, a, they have a bit larger training set, just more people, less privacy. More data makes things a lot easier. You don't have to have as good a mouth if you have a lot more data, like order magnitude, two order magnitude more data, trade that for mouth. Secondly, um, they absolutely have better chips than people realize. So you need compute power, c- computing capabilities. They have some pretty cutting edge chips that have not been appreciated. I didn't really appreciate it until relatively recently. Third is the organizational structure that leads to success in AI may be uh, driven by some brute force, like large organizations with brute force. That's not the typical Silicon Valley style management. So we may be at a competitive disadvantage there too. Those three things are very dangerous because if we lose this war, the United States is going to be very much in jeopardy. You said a year ago when we sat here, Miami Tech Week, uh, San Francisco is the next Detroit. Yes. Uh, We've seen some reinvigoration with artificial intelligence energy in the last few months. Have you changed that opinion at all? Uh, no, San Francisco is the next Detroit. You can look at crime statistics, vacancy statistics, homeless statistics. I see the governor's sending in federal troops or sending in the National Guard or something, um, which actually sounds like Detroit. The only thing that would make it more Detroit is like riots to the National Guard. Um, and then we'd actually look like 1960 you know, montages. Um, so no, it's getting worse, not better. I think you can see some trends in the South Bay that might be a little bit better. Um, I think there is a bit of resurrection around energy about company building that's real versus entitlement versus woke, you know, in the pockets like Mountain View and South. Um, So maybe slightly more optimistic there. But of course, that's also a lesson of history. San Francisco as the epicenter of technology wasn't really a true story until at least 2010. All of the technology companies that people remember were built in the South Bay, not San Francisco. And it's only like the modern Square, Twitter, you know, Airbnb that were SF phenoms in that relatively recent era. So I, I think it's an anomaly anyway that San Francisco is equated with technology. How is Miami trending these days? I've seen people on Twitter claim that there's certain people moving back to San yes. Francisco. So every time I see someone tweet that someone moved back from Miami to San Francisco, I'm like, name a single person. And they never cite a name. Like, I'm like, I don't know a single person, socially or professionally, that moved from the Bay Area that's went back. Single person. I'm, I'm happy if anybody tweets a name. That'd be great. Um, I do know people who've come here from New York and moved back for whatever set of reasons, and maybe some other geos, but I don't know anyone in the Bay Area, which it'd be like, you know, it's like, do you want to like set for the next 10 years and be in misery or do you want to be happy? When people move to Miami, they are inevitably happy. So for example, uh, 60% of the Teal Fellows are in Miami this week for their reunion, 10 year reunion. And most of them actually had not been to Miami before. I went to an aggregation, a party sort of thing, Saturday night and talked to a lot of Teal Fellows, probably talked to 40 Teal Fellows. Um, my my uh, uniform, that takeaway was, wow, they're being blown away by Miami in the first 24 hours that they're on the ground. And I've already persuaded about five or six to cancel the return flight. That's pretty good for, you know, two days in Miami. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, listen, I love coming down. That's my metric for Tech Week, by the way. So what fraction of people here come as in the magnet is Tech Week and what fraction cancel the return flight? What's, what's your most contrarian view today? It's a great question. It's actually, I don't have a good answer and it's very embarrassing. I got asked this at the Teal Fellow event and I'm super embarrassed by this. All my views that I've had are out there in the public domain, and I think most have been validated by history. Um, you know, the idea that remote work was fiction, I think, is more conventional. The idea that you know the coronavirus was you know not a, a byproduct of some bat biting some you know, random person in some wet lab is almost surely true. You know, my, which Bloomberg dismissed as a fringe theory um, only a year ago. Um, the uh, idea that you know the markets were overinflated and were on the precipice of a 1999-2000 collapse has obviously been true and proven. 
Um, so I have to come back with new ideas. Um, the more interesting version of this is how do you get these new ideas, props. And so what I tend to do is I like to read books, like real books. Um, and by reading books that other people don't read, you spark, you, you encounter new anecdotes, new data points, and new ideas. And then those kind of combine in your brain, often when I'm sleeping in the middle of the night, to be a spark. And that spark is something that creates the next contrarian idea. What's the single most impactful book to you over the last, whatever, 30 years? Uh, to me, is a little bit different than the single most impactful book. I highly recommend The Upside of Stress. Um, about, it's all about why the benefits of stress, the challenges of stress are good for you physically, emotionally, health, uh, health, you know, financially, and from a health perspective, it's very counterintuitive. But I already believe those things. The book is just a manifestation and evidence that I can give to other people. Um, the most impactful to me, that's a really good question. Most books that really resonate with me are manifestations of things I already sort of believed. Professionally, high output management. Yeah. You know, for the first 15 years of my career in technology, I reread it at least once a year and always learned new things, always wound up underlining new sentences because I appreciated them differently based upon my new experiences. So that was probably pretty influential, actually. Speaking of contrarian views, what's the biggest misconception of open doors business today? What would you say to short investor or people that don't believe in the business? Well, some people think it's unprofitable, which is ridiculous. Um, like if you look at, uh, it's in live in 52 markets and with a blip of maybe one quarter when interest rates spiked all in the same quarter, um, the company has been profitable for 22 of the last 23 quarters, I think, or something like that. And in 47 of the 52 markets, the, the inventory looks pretty good right now. I mean, they're gonna do an earnings on May 3rd, so we'll get the latest update. But I think there's some misinformation actually, truthfully, out there. Secondly is I think that people don't understand. Um, I think it's actually been good to go through kind of a housing crisis. Um, once the company gets through it and shows that it can navigate it well, I think it'll get disproportionate credit. Square went through something like this. Tesla sort of went through something like this. Amazon went through something like this 30, you know, 23 years ago. A misappreciated business. Um, eventually, you know, the metrics line up. People have to, you know, realize and recognize reality. A top-down perspective on open door is simply it is impossible to fathom that in all of the trillions of dollars of residential real estate that goes on in the United States, that the largest market cap company is gonna be at $10 billion, which is roughly where Zillow is. That just doesn't make any sense. You're a frequent user of Twitter. Uh, are you friends with Elon? How would you characterize it? You used to work with him. Uh, well, I, he was on the board when I was at PayPal. I, I've considered uh, working with him at SpaceX back in the day in 2003. So you've known him for a long time. Yeah. What's your opinion of Twitter right now? Um, I like Twitter. I use Twitter. Um, I think, you know, as I said uh, on stage recently at a conference, he's making all the right enemies. So I use the link and adage to judge people. You can judge by someone by who their enemies are. And since all the, all the people who are most wrong in the world and most evil hate him, he's doing a great job. How do you use Twitter? Like, what is your intent besides, besides pro you know, you do a good job of using your platform for companies and whatever. But sure. Um, the original use of Twitter for me was just like a custom New York Times. Like I used to read the New York Times on Sundays. And so I created the right people to follow in sports, politics, and technology. And I would then be able to you know, wake up in the morning and track what was going on in the fields I care about. And so that's how I used it. I didn't actually use it as a broadcast mechanism for a very long time. Then when I joined Square, I started using it for customer feedback, meaning I read every single tweet about Square for two and a half years. And I'd retweet some to you know, help the company amplify its message and story, which actually helped raise venture capital, truthfully. Um, this is before it became cool to do this, and like, so VCs weren't quite as savvy about this. Um, but that's how I mostly use it. And then I would typically only use it for broadcast around sports, uh, because I was a big sports fan. And so I figured that was safe, you know, running companies, I could talk about sports less controversially. It wasn't until I became a VC that I started using it more to proselytize. And I used it to proselytize because I realized I had a platform. I had a lot of followers. I had over 100,000 followers. And I didn't want to wake up at the end of my life and say, I had this platform. I had the ability to influence people remotely that I'll never meet and change the world and impact their views and not have taken advantage of it. And it was actually refreshing. At the same Teal Fellow party, I had a, a couple of Teal Fellows come up to me and say, thank God you tweet what you do because it's helped reshape my brain around X, Y, or Z. So that totally justifies the effort to proselytize ideas. But mostly it's because I know I have the potential to impact people and I don't want to regret living my life without having been able to try to influence people. Have you ever regretted anything you've tweeted? Yeah, I mean, mostly because of the distraction. 
Um, meaning like I think most of what I tweeted or all of what I tweeted is accurate, but or wouldn't have tweeted it, but there are times when either you slightly miss say something or you step into a landline and then the rest of the day you kind of have to respond to it. And like, look, I have things to do. I have a company to run and investments to make, meetings to take. And so once in a while, I'm like, oh shoot, you know, do I really, is it really worth like three hours of distraction to have done this for whatever upside? You do meet founders this way. Founders are really happy about your willingness to defend their company. Every company struggles at some point and having uh, VCs, people with, you know, presence on Twitter that are willing to defend the company when the company is under pressure. I did this with respect to DoorDash when people are like, oh, DoorDash is never gonna be more successful than New Reads, or DoorDash is never gonna make money. So like leaning in and, you know, helping uh, crystallize the true story can be very valuable to companies, but the distraction isn't always worth the cost. So I've been more guarded sometimes now about like, oh, this week I'm really busy. I don't have time for two extra hours on like Twitter debates. Yeah. One that I wanted to ask, and we can answer if you want, but you overlapped with Bob Lee at Square. Yes. And he had moved to Miami. He did. How will you remember, obviously, tragic events and we're still sort of unfolding. What What would you like people to know about Bob? Uh, Lee yeah, so I'll give, you some unique, I'll give you like unique insights. Like, obviously, you know, lots of other people will comment that knew him better, you know. Um, but... Um, Two Bob anecdotes. Um, one in Miami one is to show you how Miami was really tracking. He literally moved here and texted me after he signed the lease. Like I had nothing to do with moving him here. He just texted me like I signed the lease in Edgewater. So that's when I knew Miami was really working was like Bob moved here proactively without my involvement and texted me after the fact. Okay, second, a kind of better anecdote was Bob Lee actually hired Delian. Um, the engineering team at Del uh, when Delian interviewed as an intern had rejected him. The recruiting team actually sent him a rejection note. This is at Square? At Square. And Bob personally overruled the team. And so they had to call Delian after they sent the rejection and say, you know what, we didn't really mean that. So Bob had this spike and spidey sense for real talent. And otherwise, you know, my life would probably be different if I hadn't met Delian. Delian's would probably be different. So one person going out on a limb because they had confidence and conviction about someone totally changes the world. Very cool. Well, Keith, thanks for doing this. Thanks.